Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. There were so many topics that I considered speaking about this evening when Yaga asked me to be the speaker. I could speak about all the issues that West Indies cricket faces and the controversies there. I could speak about my own slight embarrassment that Jamaica is not even hosting matches in the T20 World Cup. And here we are hosting matches in the T20 World Cup in, in Broward County. I could speak about how cricket is exploding around the world, including the United States. Um, okay. But at the time when Jamaica is actually retreating, I could speak about the fact that this banquet is being Check held it here Check in honor of our legend in Check Florida. Up. And in particular, in honor of Yaba Row and not in his homeland Jamaica. But I decided to put up right here to honor our legend and to honor Yaba that I will talk about as a Boy growing up in Jamaica in the 70s, I'm a proxy for what Yaga Row meant to Jamaica. So I want to tell you about my experience of what Yaga meant to me. You see, I had my first test match in 1968. That's the first test match I went to, 1968. I was six years old. And I only remember two things. I remember the crowd roaring as this tall gentleman pushed the gates beside where I was playing, and he had his collar turned up, I'll never forget that, and he walked out onto the fields. I also remember my eyes and my nose burning, yeah. and my father covering my face with a wet handkerchief. Yeah. The tall gentleman with his Much collar better. turned up turned out to be Sir Gary Sobos, and I gather he made an incredible hundred that day. I don't remember one ball of it. I don't remember seeing any cricket. The burning was because there was a crowd riot and some ill-directed tear gas flew into Kingston Club and that's what burned my eyes and my nose. They were trying to quell the, the crowd riot. So I don't have any conscious memories of Sabina Park from the 1960s. No conscious memory of cricket in 1968, my first test. Until a fateful day when I turned eight. And my father, as usual, took me down to Sabina Park and Jamaica was playing Guyana. And I was sitting down drinking a soft drink, watching the players warm up in front of Kingston Club. And this young cricketer hit a ball over the fence and bust up a shin. <laughs> my father cuss him out. Cuss him out. He was the most apologetic youngster. He went and got ice and applied to my shin. And I paid adoring attention to this man because in, in those days, the players sat in Kingston Club and I sat right alongside the players. And this youngster, every time he came off the field, because he was batting all day. And when he would come in, he would come and check on me if I'm doing okay. If it was America, I think he would have been just checking on me to try and avoid the lawsuit. It turned out that Youngster was Lawrence Rowe. I didn't know his name, but everybody called so him. So, would you drop, yeah. would you drop Chanda Paul? Because I would that drop moment him. after he scored 147 runs that, that day against Guyana, I was hooked. I became a disciple. Colonel Owens, I you think so? I preached the gospel of Yaga in every cricket conversation I had anywhere in Jamaica. My father and I would often talk about cricketers. And his favorite was Frank Warren, who I never saw. And he would tell me how Yaga reminded him of Frank Warren. Anybody who saw me play in my very undistinguished cricket career, they would know who my favorite was. I walked to the wicket like him, but dragging in my right hand, I stood at the crease like him, my cap, Peak was turned up slightly like him. I tried to whistle 
while I parted like him. So Kirk coming out, Odio go with Everybody was Joel Anjo, the 16-year-old who scored the 130 in the, f- in the first here, World Cup match, under-19 World Cup match. Joel Andrews is also the wicked keeper for the, the team. Can tell you, they call me Yards. Would you push him Everybody in the deep Everybody knew me as Yards because I idolized this man as a young cricketer. In fact, when I went down to Trinidad for the West Indies Youth Tournament, the radio commentator says, what, what a youngster look like young, young lad, Lawrence Rowe. Cumberbatch gave me out just after he made that compliment. He teased me out, caught, caught behind off my pants. I knew the metamorphosis was complete when I played against Yaga's Kensington Club and I walked to the wicket and played the most innocuous forward defensive prod that I thought, you know, a benign Errol Wilson delivery. And everybody dropped down on the field laughing. Whoa! Basil Williams shouted out, what up, man, give a I turned around and Herbert Chang is on his back laughing at me. The play hold up for two minutes while they laughed at how this young boy yeah, was but a It's Yaga one match and race. Jordan did make 21, you know. So we hope that Thankfully, I never stayed too long we beat minutes, Scotland so in the next so match on Wednesday. And I've to beat Rowe England also on Friday to go through. Made that 302 50 years ago. I'm going to play an interview from the captain but when I get a chance. So the listen the for that interview. Four, that was so exquisite that everybody remembers it. 250 million Belgians tell you they were there, including my friend Adrian King, who was about two years old at the time. It was an it, it, it almost ignored the avalanche of runs that was to follow. That 48 nutter was so special. What Yaga doesn't know at the time that there was a young kid. 12 years old, who, while he was batting in Bridgetown, Barbados for 302, there was a little kid in Kingston, Jamaica, batting along with him. I put on my pants, I had my bat, listening to Tony Cozio and John Arlott on the radio, playing shot for shot for 612 minutes, 430 balls. I was virtual batting before the metaverse was even thought of. When Yaga hit a four, I hit a four. Shot for shot, stroke for stroke. When he ran one, I ran one. Running up and down the hall, hallway. When um, Kali Taran nearly run him out, I shout, wait, Kali, hold on. My mother thought I was going mad. I had just taken my guard after me 300, scratching with my front spikes as Yaga would, because I'm now going to assault the world record Sobers had, and Yaga get out a full toss. A full toss, Yaga. Tony Gray, full toss. I was in the virtual batting form of my life. We could have had the world record. There are many who will recall the spine-tingling crescendo at Sabina Park that greeted when Lawrence Rowe walked out the bat. It was usually reserved for after innings, but not at Sabina, not for Yaga. This was before. And the whole Jamaica would feel it, feel that inert, that, that vibration when he got off the mark. The initial sigh, because that's what it was. Those of you who were there, it's if you're not there, it's almost impossible to describe. It wasn't a roar. It was a, it was like a giant sigh. Kirk, I'm here to agree Yaga with you. Would I would open with Mackenzie like in, the, in the second test. But, all it became but would you drop Chandler Hall or would you let him back the down the order? And then it became the roar. Because nobody could believe 
the silent violence of the stroke, the giant gasp around Sabina Park with the finest of leg glances, like leg glances. I had to wait until the umpire to not signal for a bye before you even realize that's it. You have to flip that on the corner. It was so fine. And all oh, the late cuts. Nobody played a late cut so late, so casual. I watched the 175 that he made against against Australia in the Packer series. So many times the VHS, VHS tape, black and white, that Maurice Strong had given me wore out. Incredible innings. I'll never forget a particular delivery by Mick Malone. Beautiful in Docker. Jump up in the air thinking ball Yago through the gate because Yago opened up himself for cover drive and it ducked back in. And all, was, all he saw was the ball flying back past him. Mick Malone stood up, hands are came up, looked at Yaga, looked at where the ball went, looked, looked back at Yaga, and just applauded. But the most indelible innings forever engraved in my mind is not the 202, not the 214 and 100 not all that I saw firsthand, not the hundreds against England or New Zealand. It's not even the afternoon batting with Big Richards. Again, we didn't have TV in those days. If you're listening to John Arnott on radio commentary, 1976 in England, an afternoon of batting with Big Richards. And I'll never forget the commentator saying, this must be the king and prince of world batting. And John Arnott asked the question, I'm getting goosebumps just in thinking about it. I remember it. John Arlott asked the question, yes, but who is king? It's not a disrespect of the great Big Richards. It was just that everybody knew Yaga also had something special. And this was the king and prince of world battle. But it was none of those innings. 1981 was a pivotal year in my life. I was 19, out of school, don't know quite what to do with my life, confused, lost. Up until that point, it was my dream to play for the West Indies. And I'm, I'm batting number three for the Jamaica under 19 team. And I'm thinking, yes, I'm on the path. But I'm now starting to encounter other Jamaicans and other West Indians with the same exact dream as me. And guess what? They look like them have a little bit more ability. <laughs> so when you start to play against them and you start to rub shoulders and come up against Gus Logie, Richie Richardson, Phil Simon, Roger Harper in the youth, we play youth cricket against these guys. And of course, my own teammates, Courtney Walsh. Let me just, let me just pause here to make it Categorically clear, I was a better batsman than Courtney was. <laughs> just in case, just in case anybody was wondering. But you start to see something special in these guys from young. You start to see this distance of ability, of just natural ability, of greatness. And you realize that a little Yaga wannabe is not going to play for the West Indies. Fortunately, I also had football. And I was playing for Jamaica on the 20 team at the team. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take up a football scholarship and go to college. So I thank them for showing me a different direction. I had to grow. But 1981, was also very, I got a very a special parting gift of sorts, my new life direction. This is Jamaica, England was touring the West Indies. England was touring the West Indies. Look at the 
Yes. Morocco. In the most story in the West Indies. And Yago was playing for Jamaica. I would, see, I would see him this one last time. And so he came and made a 24 not out that evening that I will never forget and the world will never forget. It was my last lasting impression and most lasting impression of Yago. In fact, it was my last childhood memory. And these guys, these legends, gave me my best childhood memories. I find it an aberration, an abrogation of the game itself that Lawrence Rowe is not honored in his homeland of Jamaica. I understand all the debates, but I am calling on the government of Jamaica, the opposition, the Jamaica Cricket Association, and the people of Jamaica to bring Yaga home and give him his due. For a generation of us, he was our superstar. He was our sporting icon. If if the black people of South Africa can forgive their own oppressors through their truth and reconciliation process, how is it that we can't honor our own? It is time. Yaga for life. Free Yaga. <laughs> Free Yaga! Free Yaga! This David looking at me when he said that. He looked at me. I, I, I don't know.